So, um, as was mentioned, I will uh, make a, uh, an introduction, broad introduction, um, actually on the links between uh, the climate negotiation process and the uh, climate uh, model uh, dynamics in the on the past uh, 10 years. I don't know if you're all familiar with, uh, let's say, environmental economics or climate change economics. So that's why I wanted to do this uh, in an introductory manner. And then uh, a paper will be discussed, uh, which I, I guess you, you will m more, uh, you will understand more uh, after this introduction. So first, let's not talk about economics at all and look at the natural variability of climate. It's important to look at the time dimensions here. Uh, you can uh, see four different sources of climate, natural climate variability. Well, the first one is the sun, uh, and the time frame is the billion of years, and uh, the sun enlightens the earth more and more. It increases by 7% every billion of years. So since the beginning of the uh, Earth, already 30% more light. Then the second factor of uh, climate variability is uh, the tectonics. And the scale, the, the time scale, is the tens of millions of years. And uh, you'll see that depending on how the continents uh, behave, more in the poles or more in the in the middle, uh, you have a, a totally different climate. Then you have the 10 to uh, 100,000 years uh, time scale, and this is driven by the orbital forcing factors, <coughs> the dynamics of the Earth around the Sun. And then the last factor, the most recent one, is uh, human development, of course. So in hundreds of years, climate has changed and will change just because uh, uh, human beings have unearthed uh, so much uh, uh, green, greenhouse gases. So this is a very rapid summary of what I just told. The sun, billions of years, uh, plus, not minus, uh, 7% seven, seven uh, every billion of years. So plus, please. Um, then the tectonics, and you have simulations of uh, the, the different kind of climates you get, you get depending on uh, the place of the continents. So for example, here compared to here, you have a very different range of temperatures. Then the famous Milankovitch cycles, the orbital parameters, you have three of them. You have the tilt, uh, which is uh, the degree uh, of the, uh, well, that's complicated to say in English, but you see what it is, right? This angle. And this angle changes. Then you have the precession. This is the dynamics of the, the, the rotation axis. And then you have uh, the eccentricity. So it changes from a full ellipse to a quasi-circle. And the periodicity of these two of these three parameters changes also the dynamics of the climate but at the 10,000 uh, years uh, period um, why is it why is it important because it gives you a, a past experience of how climate affects not necessarily human beings but biodiversity at least and you have uh, you know we had already five Full, uh, five uh, biodiversity extinctions, which were uh, uh, almost always linked to some of these uh, uh, factors changing. Uh, now, here is the very, very uh, optimal climate we, we had so that human development can occur. And uh, here are the projections for the 21st century in terms uh, of uh, temperature. So you see that we really change the, it's a, it's a kind of a, a encounter between uh, social sciences 
and uh, really uh, um, uh, climate, uh, climatology really, that we have to uh, apprehend. Um, you have a lot of literature, uh, recent literature, mostly uh, it's environmental history, it's uh, <coughs> economic history, uh, trying to look at the links uh, between some climate phenomena, specific climate phenomena. It can be external. I, I say it's external here because it's just a volcan an eruption of a volcano. Uh, and the impacts on the economy. So it gives you also some hints about uh, how uh, societies, economies could uh, behave in reaction to uh, such, uh, such abrupt changes. Uh, for example, this painting, this painting is by Turner, uh, could be uh, the kind of lights you got because of this uh, uh, Tambora eruption in the early 19th century. Um, of course, uh, the impact is not purely uh, climate related, it's a social impact always. It depends on the structure of the society where the impacts, the, the climate change, the climate impacts occur. And you have the, the most uh, horrible example here uh, with uh, a huge famine occurring at the, the end of the 19th century uh, in uh, uh, colonial India and the structure of the colonial empires uh, uh, increased so much the, the, the death toll of this famine and you have uh, all kinds of theories saying that a famine is never uh, a question of a lack of, uh, re really a lack of, uh, 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 of food, but uh, a question of social structure. So, in the recent, most recent past, you see the tendency is fully linked uh, to the, the emission of greenhouse gases uh, by uh, by human beings. So here, I guess you, you don't discover any, anything. Now, how climate change emerged as a political issue? My second point. The scientific discovery, you know, you may know it, is due to uh, Arrhenius, late 19th century. He almost guessed the right uh, climate sensitivity. Uh, climate sensitivity is the increase in temperature you get by doubling the uh, greenhouse concentration in the atmosphere. So he uh, proposed the number five, so you get five degrees of um, temperature, incre temperature increase if you double the uh, greenhouse gas concentration. And the actual values are around three, four, there is an, uh, an uncertainty around the, this specific value. We'll see, uh, we'll, we'll tell more about it later. So he discovered the scientific assessment is there at the, at the end of the 19th century. Of course, uh, no one cares at the, at the time. Now, one important date is the uh, Meadows report in the early 70s. Did you hear, uh, hear about this report? Have you heard about it? So, um, the Club of Rome, uh, it was a club of uh, industrialists, uh, bankers, scientists uh, asked uh, the uh, MIT uh, modeling team to, uh, to see if uh, growth can be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in indefinite or not. And they answered, no, it cannot. There is a limit to growth. That's the title of the report. And uh, they uh, developed a specific model to answer the question. And the, uh, the conclusion can be uh, summarized by these two sentences. Development and environment should be treated as exactly one single and the same problem. Then traditions, education, daily life necessities and selfish interests will make the transformation slow and painful. So not really an optimistic conclusion. And the current tendencies lead to a collapse in almost all their scenarios before uh, 2100. So this is the kind of simulations you get from the Meadows report. And you see that it's not really an economic model. It's more a description of uh, stocks and flows 
uh, and the dynamics of, this, uh, of these flows and the links between these uh, flows so that you can sometimes get uh, um, non uh, you can get an increase in the, in the wrong direction, let's say, uh, and at the end a collapse. And so that, that's on average what you get. And we, right now, we are uh, around here, so we should see sooner or later if uh, the middle of the report were right or not. Uh, there, there were uh, very big reactions to this report, very big uh, reactions in uh, um, we can summarize these reactions around two tendencies from ecologists and from economists. So the ecologists uh, criticized the Meadows report because of its insistence on the demographic factor and that was perceived as a uh, uh, tendency to uh, incriminate developing countries which were uh, sort of third world countries at the time which were um, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to, to, to catch up with uh, developed uh, economies. So that's the critics of a, a South American group called the Bar Bariloche Group. And they proposed other mo modeling strategies trying to really uh, show that uh, the main factor again here is not demography, it's the structure of society and the way um, at the core of their critique is inequalities. If you uh, solve the inequalities question, you can have some kind of sustainable development. Uh, then the critiques of the uh, economists were that, well, it was not uh, uh, an economic model, so it's, it's not, it has no value. Uh, it had no price mechanisms, uh, which could have induced behavior changes in the model. And um, so these critics was uh, carried by Solo and Nordhaus mostly. And you have, uh, so you know uh, William Nordhaus now. He's the last, one of the last two uh, Nobel, so-called Nobel Prize uh, uh, in economics. So at the time he, he wrote a paper, actually several papers on the, on the, um, on the report. And some of his critiques are quite uh, interesting and uh, I think w you, you can really accept them about the, uh, the calibration estimation of the parameters in the model uh, which relied on uh, guess estimates mostly. And then the critiques, uh, the more profound critiques for him were about this price mechanisms, the absence of uh, technological change. And these are, uh, I would say, more open to uh, discussion even, even now. Uh, shortly after, so the Meadows Report, 1972, then the philosophical structuring of this approach uh, through the principal responsibility by Jonas, Jonas, uh, 1979. So what did Jonas say? He didn't care so much about climate change at the time, but more uh, uh, about uh, nuclear power and the power of human beings to uh, uh, destroyed themselves through uh, nuclear power, but the same can can uh, the same kind of uh, reasoning can apply to climate change as well. So there was a necessity. This fact, this new fact that human uh, humans could destroy themselves, uh, had an implication. Uh, the necessity of new ethics to face the the, the terrible innovations the of science, technology, and the economy. Um, and we. He goes against the Cartes Cartesian logic, which considers as wrong something which is not already proven, and develop the notion of precautionary principle, which is applied um, in France, for example, it's theoretically in, in the Constitution. Not so much applied, but it still exists. So the political answer to this uh, very vivid de debate of the 70s is, well, uh, a kind of uh, uh, disappointing uh, uh, mix uh, of, uh, of uh, incompatible uh, truths. The notion of sustainable development. Uh, through a new report uh, in, the, in uh, 1987, commissioned to uh, uh, grow Harlem Brundtland, uh, former Norwegian prime minister. It's it was called Our Common Future. And 
it throws out the concept of sustainable development, which is very uh, you, you must be very familiar with now. So it is insists on the, the needs, the needs of current generations to still uh, grow, catch up for the developing countries, and the limitations in the long run uh, if we don't want to uh, uh, forbid any uh, new life on Earth in a hundred uh, in a century or two. Now. The climate change issue is very interesting because it uh, uh, leads to the creation of very, uh, very innovative uh, institutions. One of them is the IPCC, and I hope you've all heard about uh, the IPCC, right? GIEC en français. So it's a very specific institution uh, of researchers, but created. Uh, by two international organizations, the uh, UNEP, so the, the, the UN Organization for the Environment, and the World Meteorological uh, Organization. Uh, these researchers uh, commit to uh, summarize the existing science on the subject of climate change every four or five years. Um, so they represent the whole world, theoretically, the whole community of researchers interested in this subject. Um, then you have a separation between different chapters, different, different big reports, uh, pure climate, climatology, uh, the question of uh, uh, mitigation strategies, how to limit uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, and uh, model modelization, etc. Yeah, so you have, of course, different subjects. And uh, you have there have we had five evaluation reports uh, since the 90s. The last official one was in uh, 2014, but now you have, uh, let's say, exceptional reports or uh, uh, reports commissioned by for specific uh, uh, purpose purposes or questions. And you may have heard of uh, the 1.5 uh, degrees reports last year. It was uh, commissioned by uh, the the climate negotiation uh, body to uh, to the IPCC in order to see if the target of increasing the temperature by just 1.5 degrees and not more was actually feasible. It is in the Paris Agreement, but we didn't know if it was actually feasible, so they asked the IPCC. Uh, what do you find in these kind of reports? You find all kinds of uh, scientific results. First, so I, 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 give, I give you just a few examples here. You have uh, purely uh, um, pure measures, pure uh, pure data on uh, greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, and you have here three the three main uh, greenhouse cases uh, during the uh, since the the, the the very beginning of uh, the industrial revolution. You have uh, the emissions, for example, in the long run, so concentration. Emissions is different, right? You, the emissions increase the concentration, which is the stock. Uh, on the emissions side, you see here uh, the separation between, let's say, land use and the use of fossil fuels. So, of course, it seems that like fossil fuels is an important factor of the increase in uh, greenhouse gas concentrations. Then you have uh, a disentangling of these emissions by economic sectors both direct GHG emissions and indirect uh, CO2 equivalent emissions. What is indirect CO2 emissions? You know, the buildings, for example, this is uh, in the buildings that don't necessarily emit by themselves, but they uh, drive uh, emitting uh, consumption, uh, emitting behaviors, right? So that's indirect. Indirect. Uh, here you have the results of uh, climate models. And uh, at, the, at the beginning of the IPCC, in the uh, early 90s, uh, the conclusions were very prudent about uh, the, the role of uh, uh, humans in, the, in climate, climate change. And they got more and more uh, certain that uh, it was a cli uh, human-induced uh, change in climate because of this kind of simulations. You have in blue uh, the, the, the different simulations of the models uh, without uh, 
anthropogenic forcing. What is anthropogenic forcing? It's just anthropogenic emissions, right? So that's in blue. In, uh, in uh, red, you have uh, the results of the simulations of the climate models uh, with the actual anthropogenic forcing, which was measured since the 60s to, uh, to 2010 here. And in black, you have the actual data. So you see that with time, you, s you see more and more clearly that the actual data fit with uh, the scenario with anthropogenic forcing. So anthropogenic forcing should be, is the source of uh, climate change. So here you have the results at different, uh, for different continents, different parts of the world, because you know a climate model is a very, very big model, much bigger than any economic model that you can think of. Uh, imagine that you, uh, you take the Earth, you separate it in uh, different uh, cells. Uh, it's cells of uh, around uh, 100 kilometers, 200, de depends. And you separate that uh, horizontally as well. So you have uh, the low atmosphere and high atmosphere and the several uh, layers like that. And you solve uh, equations at the frontiers of each cell. So uh, one run, one simulation takes six months approximately. So you, don't wa you, you, you have to calibrate it properly before you launch it because then you, you lose a lot of time. Uh, so that's the kind of results you have here. Of course, there are, th th yeah, there are big programs of, mod of climate modelization behind that with international teams, supercomputers, etc. <coughs> so you also have in these reports, you have, uh, let's say, predictions. Not predictions, but uh, simulations of possible futures. And you, uh, the, the researchers organize these possible futures around different big scenarios. You can, you can remember that, it's important. The RCP 2.6, 4.56, and 8.5. The RCP means representative concentration pathway. It's uh, a possible uh, future in terms of uh, future emissions. Let's say it's uh, like a story we tell ourselves. So if we keep emitting like we did in the last uh, couples of de uh, couple of decades, we should be on this RCP 8.5. So that's the worst case scenario. Uh, then if we make some effort, we are on this scenario, RCP 6. More effort, a lot of effort actually, RCP 4.5. And RCP 2.6, forget about it now. You cannot reach it anymore. OK. So there are also modernization programs around uh, these uh, scenarios. And these uh, modernization programs mix economic uh, simulations and uh, climate, uh, climate modernizations. Now, we didn't talk too much about uh, equity issues, ju climate justice. This is an issue which emerged uh, right away as soon as uh, uh, the diplomats started talk talking about uh, distributing uh, carbon budgets, distributing the efforts uh, in the uh, emission reduction process. So of course, then the developing countries said, oh, we just started emitting a little bit, so you don't, you don't uh, forbid us to uh, emit further. Uh, and uh, if you look at a world map uh, where you change the size of the countries depending on their contribution to uh, the, 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 the past emissions, you see this kind of map. Of course, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia is growing very fast, but these two co uh, continents are still very small compared to the US, Europe, and uh, even uh, Russia. It, it um, gas production, I guess, yeah. So, sorry, uh, that's the title of the, this slide. Uh, there is a diplomatic principle out of this debate, the principle of shared but differentiated responsibilities. This was obtained by southern countries so that they could escape some uh, efforts at the beginning of the climate negotiations and still have the right to uh, financial transfers, technological transfers, 
and uh, uh, di a differentiate, differentiated treatment in terms of uh, mitigation options. Now, let's talk about climate uh, economy models. So, as I told you earlier, William Nordhaus got the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize uh, last year. So let's look at his famous DICE model. Sorry, it's in French, but I guess you can translate. Um, it's very simple. You have a solo growth model. And the economy, or the production function, emits some greenhouse gas emissions. You, we'll look at the equations uh, right after. This increases the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You have what we call a, s a carbon cycle here. That means that with a one period lag, uh, the concentration of greenhouse emissions in the biosphere and the surface oceans increase. And uh, with a one more period lag, the concentration in the ocean increases as well. So the, these two uh, elements are like sinks for, uh, for emissions. Um, then the increase in uh, at, uh, atmospheric concentration ten, uh, um, lead to an increase in uh, atmospheric temperature. Here again you have some uh, kind of sink with the temperature of the ocean. And the increase in atmospheric uh, temperature leads to, through a damage function, to losses for the economy. That's it. That's how it works. Let's look at the equations very rapidly. So we are in a very, uh, let's say, neoclassical framework. So we have one representative agent for the whole world. He has a utility function, which depends on his consumption and work. Uh, and he tries to maximize his wealth, which is the sum of the utility he has at each period of time. Uh, the utilities in the future are corrected by a, a discount factor. So that's the motor of the, of the model, this maximization process. Um, that's just the form of the utility function and how you can represent also the discount factor. Now, two new elements compared with uh, the um, standard solo uh, growth model. So you recognize here probably a Cobb Douglas uh, production function. Here you have these two elements. This one is uh, the climate damage function, saying that the more, the higher the temperature, the lower this factor, so the higher the impact on uh, the production. And here it's the abatement cost function. What is abatement? It's just uh, reducing the emissions. So it's an abatement effort. It's a um, a, s a sink on the economy that you have to pay each period for abatement uh, in order to reduce emissions. And it depends on the, the actual abatement, which is a, a variable between zero and one. So zero, you don't, you don't uh, make any effort. One, you, you decarbonize the economy. And just fact, uh, parameters, uh, calibrated parameters. And of course, the more you pay in terms of abatement, the, uh, the, high, uh, the, the, the lower your production, your, your actual production uh, as well. So you have a, an arbitrage to make, that we love arbitrage, between the damages you get and the cost of uh, mitigating emissions. And because you have this arbitrage, you can, um, you can have, or, no, I, I, I thought I had some simulations, but maybe later. Okay, we'll look at the result of the arbitrage later. This, you know, I guess, uh, just the dynamics of capital and uh, the, the production being equal to a consumption investment. This is the, the equation for the emissions. It's just uh, a, f um, a factor of uh, the pr production with this, this variable being some exogenous technical change and this one being the abatement effort. So the more you abate, uh, the lower your emissions. 
the DICE model just represents the dynamics of the industrial uh, emissions, not land use. So this is exogenous in the model. Then that's the carbon cycle I showed you in, uh, in the previous graph. M is always concentration. E is emission. So that's the concentration of in the atmosphere. Just 30 minutes left. Yeah, right. Perfect. So uh, the concentration in the atmosphere increases with the, the current uh, period emissions. And then you have the transfers with uh, the, uh, the, th the sinks, so the upper ocean and the lower ocean. Don't need to go further than that. And this is the dynamics of temperatures. Temperature increases because of the forcing factor. Forcing itself uh, dependent on the concentration in the atmosphere. Okay. So here you have some kind of physics summarized by a very simple equation, but a lot of physics behind it. Mm. Uh, and this is against uh, again a uh, sink, the temperature in the low, low, uh, lower ocean, ocean, which can helps lower the temperature in the atmosphere. Okay, so this is basically the mental framework. Uh, I don't know if all negotiators knew exactly the equations of the DICE model, but let's say it's the general framework they had in mind uh, at the beginning or at least between the Kyoto pr Protocol and the Copenhagen Conference. Why? Because their approach was to try to have a, a unique solution to the problem at the world level. Uh, a little bit like the uh, representative agent uh, of the DICE model. So that was optimistic, but uh, you know it was the 90s, the end of Soviet Union, one superpower, so why not? Want to try uh, a solution, an optimal solution uh, in the neoclassical sense. And it almost succeeded in the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, almost because still uh, a lot of countries were not uh, involved in the, in the effort. Uh, they were Annex 1 countries and non-Annex 1 countries. So only, basically only the developed countries had to make some efforts uh, to reduce emissions. And uh, the others uh, were in the Kyoto Protocol, but not, um, not, uh, not making any uh, supplementary efforts. Uh, you had all kinds of flexibility mechanisms, which also corresponds to uh, the mental framework, let's say, of the DICE model. So you need to have a unique carbon price uh, emerging out, out of the negotiation process, just as you have one optimal carbon price trajectory out of the DICE model because of this arbitrage you make at, each, uh, at the beginning for, uh, for, for, the, for the full, uh, full uh, future. Um, so these flexibility mechanisms uh, didn't necessarily function very well. Uh, because uh, you, for example, uh, the, the, the carbon uh, development mechanism, which was supposed to um, help northern countries, no, uh, no northern firms, um, get some emission rights by investing in the south uh, into uh, low carbon uh, projects. Uh, at the beginning, it failed quite a lot because uh, the, the, the measure of the uh, uh, greenhouse power of the different gases was not taken into account. So by choosing the right greenhouse gas, you could get thousands more emission rights uh, than by reducing another greenhouse gas just because of the, the, the greenhouse gas power. So this was corrected, of course. Uh, but then you, you always, ha you always has have this kind of uh, ways uh, to, uh, uh, let's say, to, uh, to tricher, to, to cheat, <laughs> treat, yeah, treat, cheat, cheat uh, against this kind of flexibility uh, mechanisms. One good innovation, though, is the general carbon accountability that was put in place and still exists uh, today so that you can actually measure 
the, the, the emissions of each uh, country and each uh, industry. So the European Union enters into the process. Uh, European, the European Union wanted to be the, the, the very good, uh, good student uh, and, uh, and put the, the EU ETS system, you know about the EU ETS, European Union uh, Emission Trading Scheme. So this, uh, this market of uh, emission rights to uh, on, on its most of its industries, not all industries, but most of its industries, uh, and with the idea that this, uh, this uh, market uh, can help uh, optimize the, the emission reduction process. So you had different phases, uh, let's say a, a starting phase really of three years, and then longer phases. The second one corresponds to the duration of the Kyoto Protocol, and the third one uh, took after uh, the Copenhagen conference has failed uh, and we, we are uh, discussing the, the phase four now. That's the kind of price you get in the EU ETS uh, system. So very turbulent uh, signals uh, in terms of carbon price. <coughs> That's normal actually because the, phase, the first phase uh, emission rights uh, could not be used in the second phase, so that's why the, the price falls to the zero. But then, then you, s you still have a lot of volatility, and basically the price is very uh, low. It remains around 6 uh, euros per ton. I think uh, last year it got a bit higher, uh, but in no way a signal uh, able to change the investment behavior of uh, industries and firms. The idea of the Copenhagen conference in 2009 was to uh, make the full agreement, the definitive agreement uh, after the Kyoto Protocol and to, uh, l l let's say, to, to strengthen the Kyoto Protocol. So the, the, the approach was the same, uh, just the, the condition was that developing, the developing world should make uh, the efforts, so we, we, we should not have this distinction between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 countries. So maybe you remember a little bit, but it, it failed because of different political factors. Uh, Obama was uh, discussing his uh, uh, social security law uh, uh, in the at home, so he could not he could not put all his political uh, capital uh, uh, in the in the in this climate conference. Uh, EU was the EU was politically divided. Uh, because of the, the very different energy mix between the uh, EU countries. And the emerging countries had also a strategy of avoiding constraining targets at all costs at the time uh, again. Um, so failure, failure, and there is a responsibility of the climate economic models in that failure as well. So right before the Copenhagen conference, there were a uh, vivid discussion between two uh, uh, famous economists, Nordhaus, you've, you know him now, and uh, Nicolas Stern, you may have heard uh, about him, a former uh, chief economist of the World Bank and then uh, uh, economy, uh, professor of economics at the uh, London School of Economics. And he uh, wrote a report in uh, 2006, 2007, uh, uh, about the price uh, of not acting against climate change. So basically the price, uh, the, 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 the damages we can expect from uh, climate change. This was a very important uh, report, very um, uh, mediatic. Uh, um, and the conclusion was 1% of GDP invested every year in, in 2006 and after uh, is enough to mitigate the uh, effects of climate change uh, in the long run. But if we do not act, we may end up with 20, as much as 20% of GDP uh, losses uh, in the second half of the uh, 21st century. A very big controversy uh, uh, follows between Nordhaus and Stern. Around what? Around the discount rate. So the discount rate, again, is how you uh, um, value the future so for an investment, for example, in a, a firm uses some kind of discount rate because uh, uh, <coughs> profits uh, next year are not the same as profit in uh, 15 years or, uh, or so. Uh, but the, the same, the same com 
concept is used also in macroeconomic uh, models to uh, value uh, current utility compared to future utilities. Um, and that's the, the, the f basic formulation in a neoclassical framework of uh, the discount rate. It depends on three, uh, three uh, parameters. The uh, uh, pure time preference, that's supposed to be a, um, an inner uh, preference of the representative agent for uh, the present. It, it comes from his uh, really, uh, there's, there's no way to measure it uh, it's except uh, in an ethical or philosophical uh, manner. And then the growth rate and this alpha, which is the marginal utility of consumption, and comes from the uh, functional form of the utility um, uh, function that I showed you earlier. So if we compare Nordhaus to Stern just on this, they take very different values of pure time preference and of future growth. So of course, uh, they have very different results as well in terms of optimal uh, climate policy and uh, the cost of uh, future, damage, future climate damages. So what's the difference? Uh, the main difference is here in the, the pure time preference term. Uh, Stern considers that uh, for climate related issues, which are long term issues, uh, could affect the society as a whole. Uh, you have uh, a duty to, uh, ethical, philosophical duty to take uh, a very, very low value of pure time preference because you should not consider that future generations uh, are less important than actual generations. And he justify his uh, 0.1% uh, value because he says we, we cannot, uh, maybe uh, humanity will uh, disappear at some point. So we don't take zero, we take 0 0.1%. That's his uh, justification. Nordhaus, on the contrary, justifies his uh, pure time preference by saying, okay, I took uh, the average interest rate in the market, uh, in the financial markets, and so that's uh, uh, an actual measure of uh, the valuation, the future valuation by the markets. And that's how uh, he, he, ended, he ends up with a discount rate of 6%. That means that tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's utility uh, is valued 6% less than today, and then 6%, 6%, so that in 10, 15, 15 years, what happened in 15 years has really no value at all in this kind of uh, 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 mechanism, while with Stern, a discount rate of 1.4%, 2100 is still important, is still relevant uh, for your decision today. So, yeah, that's how different the, the, trajectory, the optimal trajectories are in the two cases. So that's abatement, that means the, the emission reduction effort uh, in the case of Stern and in the case of Nordhaus. So full uh, emission reductions by the mid-century uh, in Stern's case, and that's optimal in the, in the neoclassical uh, uh, way. And in Nordhaus, very uh, slow uh, increase of, uh, uh, of the emission, emission reduction effort is supposed to be optimal. Uh, that's the value you get, the, the optimal carbon price you should put uh, on your, in your economy in order to get this kind of emission uh, reduction effort. So a carbon price, world carbon price, which goes above uh, $100 per ton of CO2, and in comparison with a very, very low carbon price in uh, Nordhaus case. So very, very different results because of this discount rate issue. So at some point, uh, some more profound critiques emerged against this, this, uh, this way of uh, modeling uh, the climate economy mm -hmm. uh, interaction. One of them, still uh, neoclassical in a way, is the, the Weizmann uh, critique. Um, he criticized basically the cost-benefit analysis approach for uh, these kind of questions. So he cannot really arbitrate between cost and benefits in the case of climate because mostly you have too much uncertainty about future climate. 
So playing cost-benefit analysis with this is like uh, playing Russian roulette uh, with yourself. And he illustrates this with uh, the, the question of the climate sensitivity. Remember what climate sensitivity is? So the increase of temperature you get by doubling the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Th this is a crucial parameter because it gives you basically uh, how the, the dynamics, the temperature dynamics of your, in your model. So uh, looking at different climate models, okay, uh, you, you see this kind of uh, probability distribution of, the, of climate sensitivity. Um, and you see that you have a low but still uh, still not 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 uh, zero, not null. A probability is that climate sensitivity may be around 10. See, it's, it's above 10 degrees here. Even if the average is around three, you have a certain percent of chances that if we double the greenhouse concentration uh, of the atmosphere, we don't get plus three degrees, but we get plus. 10, 15 degrees, so a whole new world. So in this case, with this kind of uncertainties, with this kind of probability distribution, it's a little bit the same as in uh, the financial world. Uh, you have a skewed uh, distribution. Uh, you cannot play cost-benefit analysis. It's an insurance uh, question. You have to insure yourself basically here yourself is society, against the possibility that you get this kind of outcome, which is totally catastrophic. So this is a, a very different kind of uh, choice behavior that you, you want to develop. Uh, in the early 2010s, a very strong critique emerged against integrated assessment models uh, by one of the, uh, Pindic is, was, one uh, very uh, famous proponents of s such models before. But then he came to the conclusion that uh, these models uh, are have too many flaws uh, and bring no real, really new science. And he took all the, all the problems, he describes all the problems in these two papers, 2013 and 2017. The damage, fu the damage function first, we have no clue about what happens actually above one degrees increase uh, in temperature. So how can we suppose that there is a functional form and that we know all the values for above uh, one degree? It's just necessary if you want to do this cost-benefit analysis. Uh, but if you have no idea, you, you, you cannot do such a cost-benefit analysis. Then you have circular auto-justifications of the calibration of this uh, damage function. This is quite uh, funny because he shows how uh, Nordhaus quotes someone who quotes someone who quotes someone who quotes Nordhaus as a justification uh, of the value. Uh, and then no accounts of extreme events. The discount rate, fully arbitrary. The debate is useless because you, never, you, never, you can never agree on this. If someone th say we should take this for ethical reasons and someone else say we should take this because that's the market, uh, the, the market price is that, they won't agree at any point. Uh, and then the representation of emissions, concentrations, and abatement functions are supposed to be a little bit uh, better known. And the conclusion is, what do the models tell us? Very little. So you know, you know better about this. Um, now, I want to finish with uh, uh, something about the Paris Agreement. So you all uh, have heard about the Paris Agreement, I guess, but maybe you want to have some more concrete uh, elements on this. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the general picture before the Paris Agreement, right before. So what do you recognize here? Greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So that's time. <laughs> that's 2012 something. 2015 is the Paris Agreement well, the, the signature of the Paris Agreement. 2020 is when the Paris Agreement is supposed to start to, to, to be implemented. And this is 2030, let's say, is uh, the last chance to, to change course uh, uh, in humanity, of humanity. 
So what do you have here? In orange, it's the sum of uh, all the intended nationally determined contributions of the different uh, countries. So before the Paris Agreement, all countries proposed some uh, voluntary uh, emission reduction strategy. They gave that to the UN uh, body. And so some, some uh, nice researchers uh, analyzed that and tried to uh, approximate uh, uh, an equivalent in terms of uh, emission trajectory. So that, that would be the emission trajectory of uh, the, the, cum the cum cumulative uh, national determined contributions. Um, so that doesn't lead to uh, a good outcome. So here now in blue you have the different trajectories you should take if you want to remain below uh, two degrees, below an, in below an increase of uh, temperature uh, of two degrees. Uh, so this one seems quite smooth, but it's already done. It's already behind us. And you have the 2020 one, so the one that the Paris Agreement should take. Uh, it's quite steep, no? And the last chance, 2030, let's say, is this one. So. No country has ever experienced, experienced such uh, shift uh, in, emission, in emissions, except, I will say that, what, what countries? Huh? Russia. Yeah? Russia maybe? Um, even Russia, I'm not sure, no. Maybe it was a very a shock, let's say, but then it started again. Uh, so you have... I'm not sure between this and this, but you have France during the nuclear uh, investment, maximum investment uh, process. So huge uh, emission reductions. But still, it's probably not enough to do that. Um, then you have North Korea and Cuba. <laughs> yeah, that's the examples you have. Um, yeah, so we have to invent uh, really something uh, new here, and we have no choice. Okay, then the Paris Agreement, the general structure. There is a decision, and as an annex, the Paris Agreement itself. The decision is, um, contains elements to be implemented before 2020, so we're almost there, and can be revised at any future conference of parties. So you know every year you have this climate conference around November or December. And so this climate conference adds some new elements to uh, this kind of decision. But the Paris Agreement itself is a treaty, so you don't change a word. Uh, and it's, it is in the annex. You have the constraint. Entry into force is already uh, validated. 55 countries representing 55% of emissions. The legal constraint, very low, almost inexistent. You have no legal constraint, no, obliga no uh, uh, legal obligation. The targets are voluntary, no international sanction mechanism, and a very e easy exit. Still, it takes around four years. We, we will see with uh, Donald Trump how it goes, but it takes uh, some time to, uh, to exit. Um, and the political constraint, it was the, uh, the idea of, the, of the, the, the Paris Agreement strategy was to, because you cannot create, you could not create a legal constraint in the diplomatic conditions of the time, you, you had to create this political constraint and hope that you, uh, you, uh, you create a, um, a positive dynamics of course, it's in a bad shape since uh, the election of Donald Trump and the recent election of Bolsonaro in Brazil as well. Now, the objectives. You have top-down objectives. So the temperature objectives. Do not cross the 2 degrees threshold and try to reach 1.5 degrees. So remember, 1.5 degrees. Above 1.5 degrees, some islands are fully uh, underwater, so that's... They, they didn't want to sign if there was not this mention, uh, mentioning of a 1.5 degrees target. Increasing adaptation efforts, but without any number, and aligning financial flows with these objectives. So that's the very new element in the, the, in the Paris Agreement. 
And for, for the first time, there is this very strong sentence at Article 2, should align financial flows with uh, the mitigation and adaptation objectives of the Paris Agreement. Of course, they don't explain how you would align this, uh, the financial flows of the world economy, but still, it's an objective, and all countries signed. And then you have bottom-up objectives. The bottom-up objectives are the national determined contributions. So every five years, uh, each country should, imp uh, should increase its uh, contributions. The justice, climate justice principle of uh, uh, shared but differentiated con uh, responsibilities is maintained. So you have different national contexts. You have uh, the recognition of fin financial transfers, 100 billion. There is this number, this mysterious number of 100 billion uh, uh, north-south transfers, uh, annual north-south transfers, uh, which should be reached by 2020 and increase uh, after uh, 2025. No agreement yet on how you, m you actually measure this 100 billions. Uh, and multiple exemptions for least developing countries. If you look at mitigation, so emission, uh, emission reductions, there is a long-term emission objective, which is the carbon neutrality in the second half of the century. It's a very strong objective. That means that our economies as a whole should, be, uh, should not emit more than they uh, absorb. Uh, a few countries have uh, taken this objective seriously, like for California, uh, uh, proposed to reach this by uh, 2045, for example. And Europe is discussing about uh, this objective by 2050. Uh, but by the way, for any temperature target, you should reach that objective anyway, at some point. If you, if you want to, to remain below a uh, 5 degrees increase in temperatures, you should also uh, reach carbon neutrality at some point. As long as you don't reach carbon neutrality, temperature keeps increasing. The question then is the when you reach it. And when you reach it determines where you stabilize the temperature, theoretically. Okay, mitigation. And yeah, I, I end up with three opening uh, slides on where, where the researchers should look uh, first. And I guess maybe Antoine talked about th that a little bit this morning, about straining financial assets, or at least the financial side uh, of the economy. It, of course, in, neoclassical, uh, in the neoclassical approach, finance is neutral, money doesn't exist, so there's no role for that. But in the Paris Agreement, at the Article 2, you have aligning financial flows with the mitigation objectives uh, of the uh, agreement. So you should ask yourself about uh, how you do that, and for that you should at least represent it in a model. So you should represent finance and money, you should discuss about how to represent it in a meaningful way, and they then look at the specific relations between the financial sector and the, uh, the, uh, and the climate change or the, 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 the low carbon transition also. Uh, second type of questions, the climate damage. You saw that the, the, the function used by Nordhaus is uh, just a quadratic function. It has no idea about how to justify it. So what, how can, you, can we have more information on potential future damages? What methods uh, could be used? Uh, and how does it impact also uh, the way we look, the way we, uh, we look at uh, climate economy models? So you have to, to be more specialized, uh, to use a lot more uh, the mapping and aggregating and disaggregating the, these processes. Uh, and that's, um, there's a whole stream, a whole new stream of research around these questions, a very recent stream of research. And last issue, let, uh, as we said at the beginning, climate change is not uh, a pure climate uh, issue, it's a social issue. So you cannot deal really with climate uh, policies if you don't look at uh, inequalities, or at least the structure of uh, inequalities in uh, the societies. Of course, uh, 
you've seen the gilet jaune movement uh, recently. Uh, it's only partly about this, but still, uh, it started uh, as a movement against a uh, carbon tax, which uh, happened to uh, uh, impact differently uh, uh, the population. So you have to really uh, take this question uh, more seriously. And there, there's only, it's, it's only recently that it was uh, it started to be taken into account. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to discuss um, uh, Etienne's uh, presentation. Thanks to on the basis of a paper he sent us. Uh, uh, we, I mean, probably you didn't read it, but it's okay. We'll explain the concepts uh, as precisely as possible, just to make it coherent with Etienne's presentation. So actually, uh, the question we would ask for this presentation is how us heterodox economists and critiques. Uh, can, you know, take over the role that neoclassical economists have had for so long concerning climate economics, because their uh, conceptual and modeling frameworks have been largely criticized. So first internally, through people like Pindic or Weizmann that I forgot, uh, but also we can also, us heterodox economists, have uh, external critiques on them. Uh, virtually all models, not only the DICE model of uh, Nordhaus, but a, a, a whole lot of the IPCC suite, not of not all of it, but most of them, um, are based on the Ramsey-Kruppmann uh, framework, so mainly optimal growth, optimal path, and that kind of things. Savings determine investments, so for us it's kind of a problem if we are post changes. And price mechanisms are key in that. But neoclassical economists have the policy field, and how what can us heterodox do about it. And the stance of this presentation will be, well, we need to redefine all concepts because if the concepts of neoclassical economics are ill-suited to tackling uh, ecological issues, maybe that's the case for us uh, heterodox, uh, especially because we don't do much of uh, ecological economics. So um, we'll go through three concepts, which are scarcity, money, and investment. And I give the floor to Martin for scarcity. Thank you. Okay, so what I'll try to do here is first take a sort of meta point of view and try to understand why um, actually even if they have been until now attempts from the heterodox camp to try to tackle the issue of sustainability, these attempts have not been quite successful so far. I think that one thing that is really hard for us heterodox economists when we um, uh, come in the issue uh, of sustainability is to um, quit this uh, vision of uh, an economy of abundance that we have in uh, most heterodox schools, as uh, Marc Lavoie summarizes it here. And the, so the challenge is really to take back the notion of scarcity into heterodox economics. And maybe one of the reasons why we've not been so successful as at doing it so far is because uh, we don't really understand how different the notion of scarcity used by ecological economists, which is the, 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 the paradigm with which we are trying to merge, uh, is different from the notion of scarcity used in neoclassical economics. Basically, the difference between those two notions is that for neoclassical economists, uh, nature is scarce only as soon as it is traded on a market. For ecological economists, nature faces, there are absolute limits on nature. It's absolutely scarce, no matter what happens on the market or in any uh, allocation scheme, okay? And I think that here, um, one uh, economic theory that can help us go further in that direction of taking back scarcity and meet the issue of sustainability mm -hmm. is Marx and political economy, because historically, um, one could argue that for post Keynesian economists or regulationists, um, the regulated markets have been quite a, uh, a f uh, sort of first best option in a way to deal with economic and social problems, while for Marxists uh, that was rather a second best option. And the reflection about what market is and how we can go further than it uh, has been much more, much deeper. Um, I think for that we I don't think I can dig into too much details, um, but we, we should basically see market as um, 
first a theory of value, then as an allocation scheme. If you look at market as a theory of value in a Marxian perspective, basically you, you have to come back to that basic contradiction between exchange value and use value. And the problem that we have, I think, when we try to cope with ecological problems is that we're applying the language of economics of exchange value to problems that primarily do not deal with this. We should really be able to, again, start thinking in terms of use value directly, uh, think in, in, in physical units, uh, how many uh, tons of carbons can we still emit, how much quantity of water, where. The problem of exchange value is that it really has this very general and universal um, language that any commodity, uh, no matter where it comes from, no matter which ecosystem, which substance it has, has a price that is completely general. So I could go into much detail, but I think, yeah, okay, maybe just one thing that's also important from a Marxian point of view is that uh, the, the, the fact that um, uh, in, in a capitalist economy, in a market economy, uh, labor is the primary met metrics of uh, productivity, of what creates value, leads us to have completely destructive production methods because basically we're trying to uh, save as much labor as possible and we externalize all the costs on nature. And today, for example, if you look at proposals uh, in the, the agri agricultural sector of using uh, much less uh, energy and in, in um, machinery intensive techniques uh, with the, f the emerging field of agroecology, these techniques are much less intensive in labor and from the, the perspective of the current theory of value, they are not efficient, but from an ecological perspective, from the, the perspective of use value, this is exactly what we need. Um, the, so the other way to, to look at market, um, I mean, there, there would be other points to make, but uh, one thing that, for example, uh, an, ecologi an ecological economist says, Herman da Daly, um, is that um, the problem of sustainability is not linked with a specific allocation mechanism. The problem is really the scale of the economy, the, the volumes, the quotas of matter and energy that we are allowed to to use as a society, and that basically we should make a political decision about this, but then any allocation mechanism can work in order to distribute these. Um, and there I think that's also one way in which heterodox economics and Martian economics can be useful for ecological economics uh, as, as him, is that if you, th if you think of basic insights made by Marx, the problem of the market is that even though you try to come up with a, a limit on it, there are internal dynamics that will lead to the expansions of scale of the market. So I think really we should be able to um, reintroduce the notion of use value in our analysis and in our policy proposals and even think again in terms of economic planning in order to cope with uh, ecological problems. Um, then there are more specific questions, but maybe I'll keep this for the debate uh, later. Thank you. So coming a little bit from the theoretical point to a little bit more practical point and later on again to a theoretical point, um, you raised the, the concern of, uh, or like the, the issue of re-embedding liquidity as a, as a proposal for how to actually not promote a shallow um, ecological economics or like a shallow transition, which is basically just, okay, we're going to do a lot of green investment, it's going to solve our problems, but like, uh, how can we do this more profound? And one point of this is the re-embedding of liquidity. So points I just wanted to like get this out of the paper, out of the, um, the, the, the approaches you have. For example, the aim of the transition of the financial system is to respect the notion of the necessity, necessity of trust and use monetary and political authorities. So uh, money has always be, had to be respected. It has to embrace um, the idea of stationary and decreasing economy. Um, actually, we're going to talk, uh, uh, Louis is going to talk about uh, the investments as a human claim on nature. While maintaining full employment, like an idea was the uh, employer of, full, uh, of, of last resort here. Um, putting a focus on the tasks of the financial system, yeah, and to um, more go into the uh, functional sphere of, of banking, like what should be provided by, a by the financial, s financial system and what does it mean to have uh, money as a common good actually. 
Um, also like reducing crisis and instability, um, responding to the need of democratic control and local locality to build resilient communities, so like increasing democratic control on financial institutions and financial system. And incorporating, of course, uh, climate and financial justice among developed and developing countries, which is a point which is also uh, many times uh, left outside. Um, yeah. So I want to um, first go into a little bit into the um, like an approach you also mentioned, um, the ecology of finance, which is an approach um, which is based on Merton 1995 and taken up by uh, Nissan Sprott in a in a report for the New Economics Foundation in UK, I guess, which is basically saying, okay, we need to have a financial system which is not like reinventing itself or like also reinventing itself, but which is um, aligned to the the needs or to to what we need, what we what we want to have from a financial system. So uh, we want to have a payment system which is um, uh, we, uh, we want to have a financial system which um, can deliver a payment system for extent of goods and services which can pool funds for larger investments, which um, is a way to transfer economic resources over time and across different regions, industries, a uh, tool to manage uncertainty and control risks. Basically, the points, like, it's just a list, you can read it if you want to. Um, just saying, okay, we, we want to align the financial system with what we need, not with what the financial system wants. Um, yeah, coming, coming to this, um, what is the tools we can have here? Uh, one proposal was as well the idea of community development banks uh, proposed by Minsky in 1993. Yeah, um, like there's it's a similar um, type community development financial institutions. It's just called like this in the UK and US. So those um, those approaches exist already, for example, and they fulfill fun functional finance tasks and are small, local, and profitable. Actually, Minsky even argues that they are more profitable than big banks, and. Um, yeah, the problem which is promoted or like which is said in the in the literature is they are just far too small. Just some data here, in the U.S. Um, CDFI fund uh, has a like bank lending credit union loan fund is around four billion dollars in 2016. In UK, um, there's like a net of like I think 300 uh, different institutions. Oh, maybe I'm confusing here actually, but like the total lending of those is 76 million pounds uh, plus 35. Uh, uh, 35 million pounds leveraged and like one third of those um, those banks there's like the size of the of the balance sheet is like one to three million uh, pounds this is not a lot uh, Germany KFW maybe also like a development bank of Germany similar approach 76 um, point five billion euro in comparison Deutsche Bank balance sheet one what is it trillion uh, one trillion four hundred seventy-five billion. So there's actually a huge lack of, or like this is like st still a really uh, low level of what we have here in the community development banks um, sector. Then what are other tools? Um, there have been like different uh, initiatives which approached uh, things like local currencies, local exchange uh, trading systems, like LEDs in, in short, and transition towns, which basically take um, are like either complementary currency approaches, which um, which put a focus on locality, or um, which do have a different approach towards um, interest. For example, here in the local exchange trading system, um, we have you're either in credit or in commitment, and commitment means that um, that you have to serve somebody. For example, you help me for one hour, so I have to help you for one hour, but there's no interest charge on this. So there's a different value, uh, theory of value, like based on this. And transition towns also like um, promoting locality and and eco ecology. So the the question here in this in this uh, regard would be okay. There is nice approaches out there which are actually really good at developed, but they are far too small yet. Um, how can we upscale those? We have bottom up approaches, political pressure, grassroots movements, top down as well, like the um, like the uh, Paris Accord, the uh, Paris Agreement. And rethinking theory of value would be then also like a point which connects to Mata and also with the monetary growth in, uh, in imperative, which says, okay, we have this uh, interest be bearing debt system, so what are we doing here? And maybe like the, the approach of those um, LEDs system can help here to establish like a, another valuation theory in this regard. Okay, because we are running quite out of time, I will go through my part very quickly, so I'll skip that. So I will focus on the idea of not defining investment as the, the growth rate of capital, which, is, which can be you know, understood in physical terms as you know, the result of you know, 
the result of investment of investing money or in monetary term counting how much uh, we invest in the ecology transition why because this puts us at risk to pile up green investments and not to do anything more than that and actually so the idea to the idea is to define investment as a human claim on the biosphere which you know s shifts the question away from how much we pay to how much we use and what we use and actually, I think that it is a very nice evaluation tool. I understand evaluation as an ex post assessment of what's good or not. And actually, the idea, I mean, my idea is that uh, it helps to determine amongst past events, investments dues which have been uh, desirable or not. And, it's and the, the indicator we could use for that is close to the matter to those um, imagine from material flow analysis by Andrianze or uh, Kraussmann in 2013 proposed some kind of material footprint which uh, connects quite well with Mateusz's uh, comment of this morning. And but however, my first point on that uh, it's a measure at one point in time. This, the thing is that these uh, investments that have been desirable or that are desirable now may be not desirable anymore in the future because the conditions of scarcity will have changed. And my question is: Is it an, an analytical tool? So I understand analysis as an ex ante uh, criterion for decision for policy orientation and stuff. And my point is: How do we set up such a metric? What do we use an, as an indicator? Using Kaussmann's idea, so Kaussmann does not propose but mentions this per capita material use, which is the, ta the I mean, the amount of material we use in the economy, a uh, ton per capita per year, and that's a macro measure. So the production process is taken is left as a black box, and the first question is how do we turn it into a micro measure, which will be project wise, and second, it's an aggregate measure, namely we t we compare. All material inflow, we, we put all material uh, inputs under the, the metric of tons. And how do we compare two investments that have the same level of indicator but different compositions? And the problem is that, and I will end up here, is that should we use that as some kind of proto price mechanism in the sense that we need some kind of criterion that may guide policy and help us arbitrage between things in a world of scarcity, of absolute scarcity, even even if we're somehow out, out of the market. The problem is that today we have dysfunction in price relations, they only value within the market and capitalist relations. So Holt and Spash are ecological rather than Marxist economists, but that's the same idea. And, but more precisely, price represents costs or short-term expectations on, uh, on financial markets. So how do we, so should we re-embed scarcity in the pricing process? or go directly for use values as uh, Martin uh, proposed. But a most critical question I think is how do we reframe the pricing mechanism we use in the economy to direct again arbitrages in uh, an investment. So would it be a centralized auctioneer? So are we back to Varas? Or is it decentralized or locally best, locally best processes? But then it, it begs the question of coordination between these small productive units and the social division of labor, which I think is something that is often left aside in ecological economics in general. So I will go through. And then so the questions that we have. So the first question, maybe. Yeah, OK. Uh, just like. To, to go back to this division between value as a theory and value as a, an allocation mechanism, value as a theory as a, a, another form of money, actually, uh, in order to be um, put in practice, I think would need a, a complete change at the level of uh, central bank's governance. And my, my question, but it's really an open question to you guys, is well, how, how could we use um, um, a, a democratization of the functioning of central banks in order to treat money as a common and really try to completely change the incentives and the, the behaviors that are associated with money. Because as the paper showed, money is not just endogenous from an economic point of view, but also from a social and an ecological point of view. It, it should be uh, endogenous from an ecological point of view. And then, um, if we do go for this um, more radical um, decision of uh, tackling immediately use values and taking actually some mark activities out of the market, which sectors should be prioritized? 
So, me, so my question is a bit uh, short, but it, it relates to a point you skipped in your presentation, Etienne, which I would have, f would have liked to heard. Is it economy's fault, uh, the economy's fault that we are in this situation, uh, ultimately? And then, uh, if we are not in a world of scarcity, or if we are defining scarcity out of the market, can we define carbon prices then? Out, uh, out of neoclassical theory and without a theory in of incentives that us uh, heterodox don't have? My question just from before. So that's all. Thank you, folks. So thank you for this these uh, illuminating uh, comments. Um, so uh, maybe I just try to answer the questions first, and, uh, and and we can open the discussions on the previous points after, right? So about the democratization of central banks' governance, uh, that's a that's a that's a very good questions. Uh, I think we have ex examples in history, not necessarily of democratization, but of, of stronger links between uh, central banks and the political uh, uh, political power. Uh, almost all Western countries, uh, France, UK included, uh, use very uh, institutionalized this uh, this linkage between the the executive power and the and the central bank after uh, World War Two. In France, it was called the Circuit du Trésor, and you had uh, uh, all kinds of committees uh, to target uh, credit creation of, of banks uh, towards specific uh, social, uh, socially needed uh, users. So we have this experience. It's it's it was forgotten for for a while, <laughs> and now it it's, uh, it. It uh, it comes a, as a almost a sexy research question uh, again. Uh, uh, you have very very good uh, economists have have been working on 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 these uh, economic history questions uh, recently. Um, so I guess we we can get some really good inspiration from this. Of course, it's not again it's not uh, democratization of central banks per se. Uh, at the time, it was more uh, state control, let's say, of the of the central bank structure. Uh, so you 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 have to put some more democracy into this uh, past experience. But uh, um, in some conditions, uh, it, it could it could uh, it could work. Now the the political realism of such proposals is another question because of course we this the, the structure of uh, at least in Europe of the euro the european central bank how it was built uh, as a very t t fully independent uh, uh, body uh, uh, is uh, very difficult to um, to to change uh, uh, now but that doesn't mean that we don't have to talk about it <laughs> um uh, by the way, yeah, the, the, the UK um, may, may be more proactive on these questions and this discussion uh, and the de debate around uh, using the central bank's money to help the low carbon transition, uh, about using uh, the even the, 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 the English uh, gov uh, the, the governor of the, 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 the central bank of uh, England, uh, the, the Bank of England. Uh, is was open at some point to s to this to considering that uh, he could have a mandate to uh, to look uh, into uh, specific kinds of uh, financing instruments for uh, long term uh, issues um, then he refrained a little bit and uh, he he stayed within his uh, strict mandate of uh, looking at financial stability and uh, and uh, looking at climate change just, uh, as a potential threat for, uh, for, for financial stability. But the, the debate is really uh, vi vivid. In, inside the, the, the Bank of England, you have a, a research uh, uh, department which is uh, looking really into a new non-standard uh, 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 research questions such as those. And you have also think tanks around these. Uh, uh, I think there, there is a report, uh, there was a report l late uh, 2018 from uh, an English think, think tank about the Green Green Bank of England, some, something like that. You, you could like look at this report. This is, uh, uh, it was really about the, uh, this first about this first question. So, is the economy's fault? Uh, 
So I guess you know the the the, the, the book by Antonin Potier, right? Uh, how the economists uh, um, Rishov uh, heats the planet, right? Um, so he he didn't choose this title, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> it, well, it was so the the the, the series uh, around the Anthropocene uh, tries to have catchy uh, catchy titles, and then he had to explain all the time why he chose that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, is the economist's fault? Um, well, it's it's uh, it's more than the economist. Of course, the the problem is that the economist got uh, full uh, institutional position in the system justifying certain kinds of policies, and was not as a scientist should be as external to uh, the. Uh, the system it uh, it, uh, it tried to uh, analyze. So of course, I, because it he was the, the economist was a member of it and uh, often uh, at the position uh, aligned with the power. Uh, um, it is partly the economist's fault in that in that, in that sense, I guess. Um, then it's the economist's fault also in the way that it uh, let's say mainstream neoclassical uh, economics uh, tended to uh, close the discipline to other uh, sciences not only social sciences it's often uh, accused to to be really close to other social sciences but also to uh, um, to uh, to uh, how do you say so <laughs> uh, natural sciences yes thank you uh, for the climate, for example, you see that it summarizes the climate dynamics with just uh, five equations. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the only two linkages are way too uh, minimal to uh, uh, fully take into account the, 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 the impacts and the potential policies that you could put in place uh, in relation uh, with climate change. So in that way also, so that's more an internal critic this, uh, this time. It's also the economy's fault because it, it, it wants to create a fully coherent system. It's very, uh, it's very impressive in that way, in a, in a way. It's it tries to be fully coherent, internally coherent, <laughs> but then it closes to all other kinds of uh, um, uh, scientific approaches to the same kind of problem. So that's also the economist's fault in that way. That's recent. That was not always the case. Oh, that's recent. That's the 20th century problem, mostly. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, economics uh, was more about uh, looking at uh, historical facts and describing uh, 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 these processes. And the, the, the best example is Steinet Jevons, who dis described the, uh, the problem of coal in England, and right after switched uh, in his methods uh, to, uh, to uh, disconnect economics from uh, history of facts uh, to, uh, and to all the other, other social sciences. Um, can we define carbon prices out of neoclassical models? Uh, I think I think we can. It, uh, we, we, we have to redefine carbon prices in a non-neoclassical uh, way. Uh, because uh, the neoclassical way uh, doesn't, uh, as we, we've seen for in the DICE case, doesn't help uh, in any uh, uh, way in terms of uh, policy uh, implementation. So we, we should look, uh, let's say, take a more micro approach in terms of the effect, the, the actual effect of the carbon price uh, for the investment decision or the consumption behavior, uh, and then consider... Uh, just simulate that, not not build necessarily a s theory of carbon price, but simulate and uh, and understand the effect, and propose uh, carbon prices which actually have the effect we desire, um, and then it so so, so the, the the carbon price can have uh, very different uh, uh, sources. So we, we we talked a little bit about the the European Union emission trading scheme. So this, the carbon price coming from this is, is just the result of a specific market uh, built up from scratch uh, with uh, by putting a limit to uh, the emissions that uh, certain industries can uh, can have and let you let the, the industry trade be between them, uh, these emission permits and the carbon price emerge. This is different from a carbon tax. 
carbon tax is, uh, uh, th in theory, in neoclassical theory, it has the same effect uh, when you don't don't take uncertainty into account. So I, I, I know that there just a carbon tax is a public signal here. Uh, this, the, this, the monetary uh, circulation is different from uh, from the from the market, but then you you have other kinds of carbon price signals uh, as well, and we don't talk so much about them, uh, but they exist. And right now in France you have a social value of carbon, an official social value of carbon. You have that in the UK, you have that in the US. It's a price uh, determined by a few experts, uh, public experts around the table, uh, in a 7th arrondissement uh, uh, hotel particulier, uh, and, uh, and they decide what what the public investments should take into account, what, what, what value of carbon uh, um, you should take into account for public invest investments. Uh, for example, for, I don't know, a train, a railroad, etc. You should incorporate into the decision to invest or not to invest a certain value of carbon. And this is decided purely in an, let's say, administrative way. So it's also completely different from the market price and from, from the carbon tax. So you have many ways to define carbon prices. Uh, of course, around the table, some of the people say, oh, okay, my neoclassical model say this, but it, of course it's, uh, the, the model is maybe neoclassical, but the fact to decide on an admi administrative carbon price is totally different from uh, an actual neoclassical carbon price, right? Uh, because then it would be just implemented for public investments. Uh, it, is decided, it is decided, uh, it is a common decision around some so-called experts. And you, you could think also of a way to democratize that, uh, because it's obscure commissions were which are deciding that. Of course, the, yeah, there are well-known experts there, and they're, they're, they're knowledgeable, and they don't want to criticize them. But uh, that, that's, uh, that's a decision which is made out of the National Assembly, for example. And uh, you could, you, there's a link between the third question and the first one in that, in that sense as well. Um, okay, that's uh, answers to, <laughs> to your three questions. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, maybe you can also just um, say shortly something about the idea of if we have to rethink the theory of value, like um, regarding this, uh, yeah. And also the monetary growth <laughs> <laughs> imperative. Yeah. So you should build it again, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm not necessarily an expert on uh, the different theories of values, but wha what I can say, um, and this is, uh, this also relates a little bit to the paper, the actual paper, is that uh, you, you talked about this, I think, uh, the, uh, the material flow uh, analysis. Uh, is a is a specific way to measure uh, the dynamics of an economy without any monetary uh, uh, flows. Um, there's a paper just uh, just coming uh, out uh, this year, 2019, uh, about France and uh, the material flow analysis of France from uh, 1830 to 2015. And they, they built the full data set of, uh, of all material flows. Uh, so not only between France and uh, uh, abroad, uh, but also inside France. And so this tells a, a very interesting story uh, about uh, French capitalism in the long run. Um, just through uh, this material flow, flow analysis, well, well the, the important uh, factors they, 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 they show is that uh, France ran a uh, material flow deficit for all the period from 1830 to uh, almost today. So the conclusion is that uh, France very cleverly uh, uh, took uh, the, the, the right position in the, in the world, uh, uh, world uh, globalization because they managed to be a uh, core capitalist economy without at any point in time having uh, uh, an excess, uh, uh, having to run an excess of uh, material flow. Uh, on the contrary, for example, the UK or the US uh, 
run excess uh, material flows, you know, oil, coal, etc., for long periods, and that explained why they, they were they had the, the prime position in the in the world economy. But France managed to have uh, the deficits all along, uh, and still uh, uh, was a, a very important uh, capitalist country. Uh, of course. This is a very first study, and they sh the the main work they ha they, they have they've done is building this long data set. So this is also a for future research. I think there is a lot more to extract from the f from this data set. Um, also linking uh, the d French uh, capitalism to the colonies, and that was uh, that, that may be a bias uh, of their study as well. Um, what else on uh, value? <laughs> um, yeah, usually uh, with uh, Michel Aglietta, actually, we we we, pro we, we made a s short proposal around uh, green central banking uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, which proposed to use the the value of uh, not emitting uh, <coughs> as a basis for. Uh, um, Basically, monetary emission as a uh, towards low carbon investments, of course. Uh, so this is a way to uh, reframe uh, uh, very just technical, uh, pragmatic, uh, pragmatic in a way. Of course, if, if you think it's politically realistic, a pragmatic way to reframe uh, uh, the, <coughs> the, the the value around uh, the the actual, the current, and future needs. Uh, of uh, uh, low carbon transition, but of course you you will not be able to really change things if you don't change how you account uh, uh, well the value welfare. Uh, so you have to change uh, uh, the accountability, the national accounts. <laughs> you have to change also, uh, and then to you have to decentralize that at the firm level, uh, and taking account into account natural capital. So not everybody agrees around the notion of natural capital and, uh, and uh, also uh, human capital. And this is also a tricky question because not it's hard to measure, hard to agree on something. Um, so the UN uh, is very uh, innovative uh, in this uh, di direction. Um, and uh, the, the such a, a broader uh, accountability has already uh, started, but it's not institutionalized in the sense that we don't look at the uh, uh, yearly uh, deficits of the extended welfare uh, <laughs> accounts to see if we should uh, invest or less or more uh, in the economy. So it's not a tool uh, for macroeconomics uh, right, right now. As long as these institutional uh, ways of looking at uh, national accounts do not change, the value, the the, will the new value will not be uh, adopted as well. So it's complicated. So I think uh, we move on to questions. So uh, round three by three on the time. So Philips, Philip, sorry. someone else. Hello, my name is Philip from Option C. Thanks for the presentation. Also to you, to you three, I think it was very interesting. <coughs> yeah, so uh, f from your outline, what I got is that um, we need to move from uh, shallow um, uh, ecological macroeconomics to a more um, uh, deeper ecological macroeconomics. And how I understood your, yeah, like what you uh, described with shallow ec macroeconomics is that these integrated assessment models that focus on rational expectations um, and also are also based on growth. Um, uh, but how, like how, how do we move beyond? And what, what, what I know from the literature in, in ecological macroeconomics, much of the proposals are centered around um, post-growth critiques or gr critiques uh, of growth. And I would like to know your opinion on that, especially the works maybe of Peter Victor uh, for Canada, for example, because he was one of the first ones who um, actually uh, um, uh, yeah, implemented a full configuration, macroeconomic configuration of uh, an economy in the global north and comes to the conclusion that yeah, under the implementation of um, um, both ecological and also social policies of redistribution, um, uh, a country like Canada, it has been replicated for Germany, for example, um, can easily live without um, 
um, growth, he also adapts several scenarios. So I would like to know your opinion on that. So uh, yeah, first, the the critics in the paper goes beyond just uh, criticizing the usual neoclassical uh, approach to uh, climate economics. It also tries to criticize a little bit the the post-Keynesian uh, approach as well. So uh, basically, saying that the, the 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 policy conclusions, the policy questions answered by the automatically almost answered by these kind of uh, approaches uh, uh, um, run around the question of uh, how do we uh, invest more uh, in uh, green capital uh, um, and uh, how, how do we uh, create some kind of green growth uh, uh, green growth economy as well so the, the, uh, there are some common features in fact uh, in terms of the um, the way the modeling approach leads to some specific uh, research questions and policy uh, questions. Um, <coughs> now, does it mean that we should necessarily look at degrowth, degrowth series, and things like that? Um, uh, I think the the debate around degrowth is uh, that's my personal opinion. That's not in the paper. Um, maybe ill framed, uh, and I I, th I think we may. Again, and this, is, this go goes back to the previous question around value. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily about more growth or more degrowth. It's about what kind of growth, of course, and what kind of value. What kind of value should we define? And so, first, um, the kind of material analysis helps us uh, forget about the. Uh, the, the theoretical uh, additions, post-Keynesian or neoclassical or whatever, and look at the actual past uh, links. Th that that brings more, I think, to uh, uh, the um, the possible uh, uh, dynamics that we have lived in the since the birth of the industrial revolutions than uh, any theoretical modelization of a degrowth economy. But, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in uh, non-natural uh, uh, territories here, huh? so uh, <laughs> that's ju just a supposition, right? Uh, basically, I, I, I like the, the historical approach, the long time series approach. Uh, I think we, we need to dig more into this of course, we can simulate any future with any with any kind of model. You change a parameter; it, it helps with this uh, sector. You, you you can simulate any any future, but does it give you so so much confidence about the the the, the possibility of, of it? So uh, that's why I I rather reanalyze uh, uh, history, maybe in a different way, looking at uh, new new types of data. And uh, escaping the the monetary uh, um, valuation as much as possible, uh, looking at capitalism in just natural uh, with nat through natural elements, and then maybe we can discuss about a p possible deconnection or the impossibility of a de disconnecting uh, uh, growth and uh, material growth. Uh, Growth in GDP and material growth. I, I'm sure that doesn't answer to your your question, but <laughs> <laughs> more questions. Yeah. Um, my name is Louisa. I'm from Option C Development Policies, and I'd like to know how you see the differences and in, in the challenges and and the policies between developed and developing countries. <laughs> currently exchanging with um, with the German foundation uh, and one of their projects is about uh, the transformative opportunity which could be the next financial crisis so do you think in the field of environmental issues uh, the next financial crisis might be an opportunity to transform things Mm. 
My name is Tore from Option C as well, Development Policies. And my question would be, like, we're talking a lot about democratization of uh, certain things to reach the goals to build up more resilience. But what if we don't have the democrati uh, democratic like background for pushing this through? Like, when, how, how, what, what are we doing then? Because so far we don't have it. Uh, so okay, I, I answer the second one first. Uh, I think financial crisis are can any crisis can be an opportunity. Uh, the the disasters are always uh, opportunities for uh, institutional renewals. Uh, but uh, the social groups uh, uh, which uh, would uh, support this uh, institutional renewal have to be uh, ready and uh, strong a little bit before the crisis. That's the problem, and, and that's what occurred in probably in 2008. It, it was a kind of missed opportunity in a way uh, because uh, the the sources of the, the crisis were not really solved. It was a huge opportunity. Uh, it could have been a huge opportunity to transform, uh, to retransform the financial system and was a little bit missed. Of course, things have changed. The discourse has changed, but... And I'm working in a financial institution, and uh, yeah, the words have changed uh, as well, and we, we try to... Uh, uh, to uh, to put that into practice, which is not uh, easy as, practic as practitioners as well. Um, so if there is next one, I guess the social group in favor of transformation is more ready this time than 10 years ago. Let's see. Uh, now the Nostaus, um, uh, so the, the the way to deal with a sustainable development is that the question? Yeah, of course it's uh, very different. Uh, just my own experience. I'm working in with Vietnam on the on the climate impacts uh, questions. Uh, so Vietnam is uh, an emerging eco economy now. It's not 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 a developing economy anymore. Uh, Climate change is, of course, very important, but the 6% uh, percent, uh, growth rate uh, per year is also very import important. So uh, in they are very happy to uh, uh, collaborate on adaptation issues, because behind that there are uh, infrastructure building opportunities, etc. Mitigation is another question. Um, so the, the, the I guess the urgency is... Uh, the, the social support also around the, the question of climate change is very different. Um, and this... Uh, it's strange. Uh, no, no, I mean, uh, it's not. It's not stronger. I would say it is less. Uh, because development, com development comes first, and we can, of course, understand it. And uh, the development has been very, very fast uh, uh, in Vietnam. But then ecological destructions have been also very, very fast, happened very, very fast. And for s at some point, there are some uh, environmental conflicts around s one specific uh, ecological issue in a, in a city around uh, some trees or uh, which the municipality wants to cut. And there is a, almost a revolution, a violent revolution around the, these trees. So it's not just it's not that the the answer is they are not insensible to ecology and environment. Uh, there is uh, something deep uh, also uh, about uh, their links to nature in uh, uh, as in any uh, community in any society probably. But uh, of course, development has come has come first in the in the last uh, ten to fifteen years. That's for sure. Um, now, against what I've just said, <laughs> there is a whole uh, discourse saying that there is uh, an ecology of the poor, uh, um, that the most ecological uh, per persons uh, on the planet are the poorest. And they not because they are the poorest, not only because they are the poorest, but also because they organize uh, in, a, in a way which is very sustainable, uh, reusing materials, having uh, 
uh, very uh, uh, all kinds of innovations to uh, to reuse materials to actually make some uh, uh, an effort towards circular circular economy. So that's uh, the motto is that we are all in development in that way, and we should uh, uh, learn a lot uh, from this. Um, and you have a Spanish economist. Uh, uh, his name uh, doesn't come come up. No, but we'll come later. Huh? Same. Well, Tell me. A joke. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> who wrote uh, <laughs> L'écologisme des pauvres? So, the ecologism of the. Why, well, Martinez Allier. Thank you, Martinez Allier. Uh, you should read it, with all kinds of examples uh, around uh, uh, this this issue. Last thing, democratic background. That's a very difficult also one. Uh, we see that in so-called developed economies, such as the US, they elect uh, Trump, which, uh, who is fully against uh, the Paris Agreement, all kinds of ecology. And even uh, uh, in uh, European uh, countries, uh, there may be some kind of discourse around uh, ecology, but the facts are not necessarily uh, following. So. Uh, I guess the, the debate behind that is, uh, can we do a transition in a dem fully democratic society? Uh, or do we need some uh, kind of stronger um, uh, but enlightened uh, uh, government? So I won't answer that question. And, uh <laughs> and uh, we have the example of China, who, which is supposed to uh, behave uh, quite uh, efficiently, or at least uh, um, strongly uh, now uh, in the direction of a more uh, ecological uh, transition, uh, less uh, polluting uh, uh, economy, uh, because it has the the institutional uh, power, of course, to do that. Uh, uh, very strong control on the financial uh, sector, uh, the possibility to target uh, credits to uh, certain sectors, the, the political power to uh, shut down uh, uh, firms uh, in an instant to because they are too way too polluting. So of course, this power uh, uh, functions. In this case, I would say in the right direction. Uh, and uh, we want, I, I mean, it's a very good question because we won't escape a uh, discussion around what kind of democracy we want for this transition. And it seems that we, prob we don't really want China, but the, our own is not that efficient as well. So we, we have to redefine the terms. I'll stop here. <laughs> okay, on the list it's Sophie. Hi, my name is Sophia. I'm from Option B. Um, I have a question that goes in a certain sense in the direction of de democracy and equality and the power of um, the climate transition to transform society. And I wonder, you've been talking a bit about stranded asset and this entire issue attached to um, that really important industries today that are worth m billions of dollars will at one point be worthless. So I wonder to what extent or how you consider the extent that the climatic tra or the climate transition has the potential to change sustainably the ownership structure of our society and was that also maybe even geo geopolitical powers? What do you see so that we actually get more equality throughout this transition or do you think, well, even if we compensate disadvantaged poor people, um, that are heavily affected by it, there will still be this gap and the, the ones powerful today will remain powerful because they have better means to adapt. So thank you, excellent question again, uh, <laughs> difficult one as well. Um, so my answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on the kind of uh, transition we're talking about, uh, because you can have the. I think we, y you can think of a transition in a, which just doesn't change too much the uh, the rules of the current globalization so this kind of transition uh, probably will uh, 
uh, increase some inequalities. Uh, if you look at the resources needed for uh, uh, massive uh, investments in, uh, in uh, low carbon technologies, uh, the resources are not everywhere. There are a few elements are only uh, um, uh, in the hands of China. Just. <laughs> uh, um, the technologies also are not everywhere, and uh, and this kind of transition uh, will probably uh, just worsen uh, uh, the um, the current inequalities. Uh, and then uh, the transition you can you can think of the transition as uh, an opportunity again <laughs> to uh, to rethink about the institutions of the globalization. So. Uh, limit some kinds of uh, uh, trade uh, um, that you don't uh, really need, um, put some carbon uh, price at the frontiers, uh, uh, limit uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the arbitrage for uh, uh, environmental uh, reasons uh, and social reasons. Uh, and this kind of uh, transition, it's, it's an archetype, right? Uh, you can have uh, everything in, in between. Um, this kind of transition may um, also disaggregate the sources of uh, political power and, uh, and give back some power to, uh, to people, so maybe also lower the in inequality questions. Um, you have a very good example um, for Europe, for example, uh, you can think of the huge, um, um, how do you say, photovoltaic farms that are put in place in the Sahara with the idea to uh, to, to to launch all this electricity to uh, to, uh, to connect all this electricity production to Europe. So that's typically the kind of transition where you don't change anything to uh, the, the not only the power, the electric electricity power structure, but also the political power structure. And the transition where uh, uh, there is a, a kind of, a, at, ha at the household level, a kind of control on uh, energy production, which means also ki a kind of political control, uh, uh, citizenship control. Can, can I just add to that? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I think So would you say with the example you just met with the South Sahara, would you say that we will then maybe go in a new era of, I would not want to call it colonialism, but of exploitation of like rich countries, then exploiting natural resources, so to say, because they are resources in a certain sense. <coughs> like they are resources. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, <laughs> As an uh, as an economist uh, from IFD, uh, I uh, I think um, I think that the 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 kind of neo-colonial uh, problem exists uh, from uh, the huge uh, investments of uh, China on the Belt Road Initiative, and uh, currently it means a lot of infrastructure investments. Uh, not only infrastructure investments, but also uh, cultural education uh, investments. Th so it has a, a lot of pros in a way. So China is reshaping uh, globalization. We, we don't have an idea how much, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's very, very strong. But at the same time, you have the uh, the, the, the problematic effect, which is uh, African countries or uh, Asian countries highly indebted towards chi China, and uh, when they're highly indebted, when they cannot reimburse the loans, uh, then they have to uh, um, to give back some political power. And so that, I wouldn't say that it's a colonization problem, uh, because uh, that's not my uh, expertise, but there is so s some flavor of it behind that. Uh, now the resources of uh, low carbon transition, are not necessarily the same in and in the same place as for the industrial revolutions. So there will be geo geopolitical problems anyway, but there may not be exactly the replication of what we we, we have experienced. Uh, 
Um, my name is Sophia and I'm from Option A, which is a knowledge and innovation policies. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask what you thought about um, like this, this, if we're having a sustainable transition and we're having political parties changing every uh, few years and what we're seeing now is that what people are voting for uh, does not really prioritize this ecological issue. It's more about like migration and national safety and not really in terms of ecological issues. Uh, so how how does this affect I mean the sustainability of of this? Well, I, I think we are going back to the previous question on uh, de democracy and uh, transition. So I'm I'm not sure I can bring more 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 than that. Uh, <laughs> Very last question. Yes. Um, so my question is about if, if we do really get this green monetary policy, which will be somehow expansionary. I, I'm thinking, for example, of proposal as uh, the one you mentioned with Michel Aglietta, with carbon certificates, or even, I don't know if you know about it, but the proposal that uh, our professor Robert Gutmann developed um, to go further than this proposal. Um, in that context, so this kind of green monetary policy will somehow be, th there will be in inflation threats um, with this kind of proposals. And, my, my, well, my question first is, do you think there are really inflation threats? And um, is it really a problem? But then, um, I mean, we, we could say that this is the same argument as always, but the thing is, I think, which is different here is that usually the argument that we have against this uh, inflationary argument is that uh, as long as the the, the monetary expansion uh, y is used to um, is directed at productive investment, there is no not really a problem. But here, the objective is actually not to produce more, but to produce less. So, would it reinforce the threat? And what's your opinion about such arguments? So we had these questions. Uh this kind of questions uh, many times uh, when we came up with the proposal in 2015. So first at the time, and uh, inflation inflation was very very low. We everybody was talking about uh, secular stagnation. So we so, was, so that was not really a problem. So the first first line of argument <laughs> that would be a good idea to have some inflation. Uh, then I think that then we we can again come back to uh, the experience of, uh, of the the monetary policy in the 50s and 60s, looking at how they managed uh, to to uh, to control uh, in the inflation and to to arbi arbitrage between some inflation and some more uh, credit to uh, to the economy. Of course, the inflation was much higher uh, than today. Which, uh, why not? That's not necessarily a problem. That's uh, the um, the the sign usually of a more dynamic uh, economy. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, there will be a discussion around inflation probably. Uh, if this goes massive, which is not really the case uh, now, um, and you need uh, an institutional body to discuss and arbitrage uh, this, so the 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 inflation objective and the common good uh, <laughs> objective. Uh, by the way, there, there was a, a law um, which was discussed uh, up to the parliament in France in uh, 1981 around the idea to use uh, central bank uh, money for energy uh, infrastructures. Uh, um, and it, it was really discussed very far and then stopped. I don't know exactly the the details of the why it stopped, and mm. but but that was the I think the moment where uh, it, it went uh, really uh, really far, not just in proposals, but uh, really in uh, political debates. I think we'll stop here. So thank you, everyone, and see you next week. <laughs> and thank you, Etienne. <laughs>